So I think we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. This is the TCARM Summer Research Studentship Program session. Uh, just so hopefully you're in the right place. We are here to give you some information about the TCARM Summer Studentship Program. Uh, we received a number of really great questions in advance. So uh, I will go ahead and uh, take, go through the answers to some of those questions and hopefully that takes care of many things. Um, and then we will have lots of time for, for other Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions uh, at the end or as we are proceeding. I also want to introduce Philippe Margado, who's presenting here with me. Um, he is our, the TCARM education co-lead uh, with me, one of the NDPHD students uh, working on the education portfolio. So also uh, here to answer any questions as well. And acknowledge our team, uh, Zoriana and Dom, who are uh, behind the scenes as well. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So uh, many of you would have heard of TCARM, but some of you may, may not. So just give you a brief uh, overview of what TCARM is and what we're all about. So it stands for the Tamadi Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, Research and Education and Medicine. And we're based out of the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, we have been supported by a generous donation by the Tamerdi family and our goal is really to advance AI in medicine through multidisciplinary collaboration um, as well as educational initiatives and we really engage a broad group of stakeholders and healthcare providers, computer scientists, statisticians, engineers, industry and more so we're really focused on bringing these multidisciplinary teams together to advance AI in medicine. Uh, we launched in October uh, 2020 and uh, we've had a, a range of programming, a full year of programming up to this, and this is the second year we're offering this specific program that we're gonna talk about today. So let's go to the next slide. Also, just to give you uh, a sense of the other things that are happening in TCARM. So uh, the education uh, side, which is again, myself, Philippe and uh, Vinyas, who's not here today. Uh, we have uh, a number of research initiatives on the go. Uh, including uh, grant funding programs, and uh, we also have infrastructure development. So developing infrastructure where we can actually host data to really accelerate collaboration and use of these data for AI and medicine. So you can check all of that out. I want to talk next slide specifically just on the education piece, because uh, all of you might be these different sort of uh, at the areas which we are hoping to target with our educational initiatives. So when we think about AI and medicine, uh, there may be an applied clinical user. So somebody who will not necessarily develop the AI technology, but they will interface with it. And, and to interface with it, you do need training, uh, maybe a certain level of expertise and understanding of what it does and doesn't do. Of course, you have lots of technical uh, expertise needed, and these might be uh, individuals who are focused on methods development, uh, developing new methods or applying existing uh, AI methods in new ways. And they may not come from the healthcare field, they might be from computer science or engineering, but they might wor work and apply their work in the healthcare space. And then of course, there's the application of AI. So we have lots of questions in a clinical context of ethics and appropriateness and how do you make complex decisions. And so there's lots of need for people with focus, expertise and attention on this. And then you have crossovers. So the point of the slide is just to say that a program like this isn't for any particular individual. We know that we need lots of uh, different types of people to inter interact. Um, projects may span different areas. So you, it might be a technical methodological project. It might also be on the application um, or uh, you know, the implementation side of it as well. So that's our frame when we think about training opportunities at TCARM. So just to give you a bit of background, last year we launched our inaugural program um, and we were so delighted to host both uh, undergraduate students as well as medical students uh, who were interested in the field of AI and healthcare and they pursued a really interesting range of projects. I'll give you a snippet of that. This year, we are uh, fund, committed to funding 20 uh, summer studentships. Um, students who are accepted into the program will take a, undertake an AI research project uh, under the supervision of a TCARA member. And uh, 
the, the expectation is that a student works full-time over the summer, a minimum of 10 weeks between the period of May and uh, August, 2022. So a uh, lot of questions we get, you know, what type of projects do people do? And this is a list of just some of the projects, not all of them, that were uh, funded last year. So you can see there's very specific, um, you know, machine learning, uh, uh, methods apply to specific clinical care. Um, some of this is about understanding uh, bias in the types of machine learning methods in the clinical context. Uh, some of these are imaging. Some of these are using clinical data. Uh, some of these are qualitative studies. And this is speaking to the implementation of AI and understanding um, how you actually you know, build partnerships in this space and what uh, ethical considerations need to be considered. So hopefully you get a sense that the, the, the breadth um, can be broad and uh, can, can be very specific areas of medicine uh, as well. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna start going to some of the description of the program. Um, and then uh, before we do that, We'll, we'll just pause for a moment and then go into some of the questions that we received. So um, this uh, pro competition is not restricted to U of T students. T Karam is based out of U of T, but students from any Canadian university who are currently enrolled in an undergraduate or medical degree program from any Canadian university um, who will complete their either undergraduate degree or medical degree program in May 2022, but not earlier, can uh, enroll in this program. And you can you know, read that detailed requirements on the website. Um, international students also currently enrolled in an undergraduate uh, degree program uh, at any Canadian university are eligible. Uh, they must be able to legally work in Canada to receive uh, the stipend. Uh, the stipends are a minimum of $6,400 and it's co-shared with the supervisor. Supervisors may decide to top up that and that's the uh, more than, they are more than welcome to do so. Next slide. So what are these applications being evaluated on? So uh, the, each of these applications are looked at for, um, among these particular criteria. So the first one is that it, it has to have relevance to AI and health. So that should be clear from the application that this project is advancing AI and health um, in some one way, shape or form. Um, the training environment is also something we look at. We, we uh, make sure that the student who will be in this environment is well supported, that there's some ongoing work already in the lab, there's some expertise already on the lab that they will uh, learn from. And so th those strong training environments and applications with those strong training environments uh, will be adjudicated uh, more, more favorably. We look also at the student's academic record um, and uh, ensure that that you know, is one way to look at whether this uh, student has a strong track record of academic success. We also will look at any special or particular uh, accomplishments or training that are relevant to our application. So perhaps they had done some previous work, they have demonstrated success on this area, they're building upon something, they have specialized training that might indicate this is going to help their success. It's not necessary, but we will look, consider that if that's also there. And we also are trying to consider equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, uh, considerations, ensuring we have a uh, diverse cohort and uh, ensuring that our cohort represents our population uh, as best as possible. Next slide. Um, so these are the specific questions. Before I go into this, Philippe, is there anything you want to add just high level about the program before we go into q and um, I guess a little bit about the structure of the program. So last year was our inaugural year. And with that, we tried a couple things that we want to make as part of the uh, tradition of the program with each year. Um, none are super intrusive into your day-to-day -day research activities, but They'll include things like seminars in which invited speakers will come and talk to you about their research, as well as more career oriented talks to help you think more broadly about your place in the field of AI medicine. Um, in addition to that, we have a mini conference at the end of the summer, um, which is pretty low key. We ask students to submit a one page abstract and present a very brief uh, presentation 
uh, likely over Zoom this year as it was last year, so that all the students can get to know each other's research and whatnot. And finally, one thing that we did last year that we would hopefully like to continue this year is um, frequent check-ins. So either a bi-weekly or monthly Zoom meetings with the students, such that students can present a quick one minute update of their work, nothing to um, be evaluated over, but really just an open forum in which we could talk to each other about our problems, our issues, and maybe come to help each other a little bit in our research plan. So we really encourage a collaborative environment uh, amongst the students and also with us as well. So um, we hope that you can gain a lot not just from your research lab, but from the general environment of the research program that we're offering here. Wonderful. Okay, so let's go on to some of the Q&A that we've received. And I know some are coming in the chat. <clears throat> we'll also try and type some answers in the chat um, as we go along so you can have a look at those. Uh, the first question that we got, I'm interested in this plus other research opportunities. Can you add me to the mailing list? And uh, we said yes, and we just want to share this one. We do have a TKR mailing list. So we want to make sure that if you're not on the TKR mailing list, please do get on uh, the mailing list. That's the best way to get uh, information on all of our types of programming, uh, not just the undergraduate student program. Uh, how many student positions are available? We do have 20 positions that will be funded this year. Uh, so that gives you a sense uh, of how many positions are available. Are students from other medical uh, schools eligible to apply? Yes, students from any Canadian university are eligible to apply. So international students can apply as well, but they have to be studying at a Canadian university. Will this count for, um, towards the research and opportunities program? And this particular program is not part of that uh, formal program and, and will not count as part of it. Um, how do we go about finding supervisors? So this is a really good question and um, I'll, I'll uh, read what we have prepared here and also just give you some additional thoughts. So we did put a call out for supervisors who were interested in taking summer students. So if you don't have a connection or uh, you don't, you haven't been able to reach out to a su uh, supervisor, you can, you're welcome to look on this page and you can peruse any of the faculty that are looking for supervisors and reach out to them. Now this is this application is submitted with your supervisor so you would reach out to the students the the faculty that have um, said that they are interested in taking a student they would agree to take you on and you would put in your application together. So that's one thing about this program it's not a matching program it's about uh, putting it in with your supervisor and putting that application in together. But for those that don't have any idea of where to start, this is a great place to look for ideas. Um, you also can contact supervisors that are not on the list. So some, many of our faculty may have just not put out uh, a project there, especially faculty who have big labs and lots of work happening in the space. They almost always have room for a summer student and take summer students. And so you are welcome to reach out and say that you're applying for this program. Um, and that many faculty will know about the program as well. So it's not that you have to be limited to those particular calls only. You can reach out to as many as you like. Um, their eligibility has to be confirmed and that they has to be, have to be a TCARM member. And if you come across a faculty member who's not, they can join anytime. So it's not a, a barrier. They have to join and become a, um, a, a member. And there's some uh, faculty requirements. They do have to be a faculty um, uh, member. So you, that's clearly stated on the website. Uh, Philippe, do you have any other thoughts about how students might uh, go find supervisors? Well, the, um, the list with supervisors is obviously where you would start. Um, you know, classic strategies that you employ to figure out your summer research programs um, work great here as well. You know, the classic cold email can get really far in something like this. Um, TKRM is a departmental unit that has become much more familiar within the Faculty of Medicine um, this past year. But we're, as we're still new, there may be certain supervisors that have research projects of interest that may not be aware of us, especially those that may be a little bit further from the Faculty of Medicine, such as those who have applied uh, research in uh, Department of Computer Science and other things like that. So feel free to reach out. Um, furthermore, if uh, you'd like to have more information specifically about where potentially to look, um, I'd be more than happy to help guide uh, you guys in the right direction. If you'd like to provide or uh, reach out to me in an email, I'll provide my email address in the chat or further questions. Uh, 
for in that vein. So. Thank you so much, Philippe. Okay, let's go to the next uh, the next one to see our next bunch of questions. Um, and and thank you so much to Zoriana uh, and Philippe and others who are typing answers also in the chat. So you might want to check the answered box of the Q and A. But some questions may have come up there. Um, so what would the location of study be? Can we work remotely in this position? And so the location for each student really depends on the project. So. Uh, the project may uh, be located right at the University of Toronto, or many of our projects are actually based out of our affiliated research hospitals. Um, and many of them uh, either required or allowed the student to, to work remotely, um, mostly due to COVID. So many of our projects last year uh, were remote projects. And so either they were conducting research or accessing data uh, remotely and actually not physically going in. Um, other uh, projects did require physical going in. And of course, um, those are all done in accordance with the public health guidelines and uh, all the measures that are appropriate for COVID. So location may be anywhere. Um, I would say probably most of our projects last year were actually in our affiliated hospitals, um, but some of them indeed were in labs located on the University of Toronto campus. So what background do we need to be competitive? So, um, you know, this is uh, a really good question. We really consider all those domains of those eligibility criteria that we uh, outlined earlier. So uh, certainly from the student perspective, we are looking for students with a very strong academic background um, and also a, a really strong interest to work in this particular area. So that has to be well articulated. But that's not the only piece. We are also looking at the actual project itself and the synergy and the environment of the project. So the project, that this is why your supervisor and the project that your supervisor is interested in with you working on is really important. We're looking at, you know, is this a, a student that's likely to succeed in the environment, but also are they able to um, really thrive given that this is a really exciting project and you can see how they can contribute meaningfully uh, in a great uh, team environment for learning. So it's the combination of those things that we're really looking for. We do ask for information about the supervisor as well as uh, information about uh, the students as well. In terms of what are you looking for in a research candidate and what opportunities would you provide them to excel in the program? So Again, uh, once you have made that match with your supervisor and you've really outlined what you're trying to do in this program and, and you've uh, discussed that uh, spe specific expertise that you might need, um, it's really about uh, evaluating the whole package as I just mentioned. One thing I should say is that you know some projects, as I was kind of alluding to with our, our Venn diagram there, will be really looking for someone with really specific technical expertise. Let's say someone in computer science or engineering to come into the lab for a specific technical problem. Other labs might be looking for someone with more medical and health expertise. They're, they have the technical solution. They're working, they're looking for more of that application and clinical input side. So just to say it can be, you know, whatever your background, if you're interested in this area, there likely is a project for you and a fit for you. And it's about finding the right one. Um, we presented the evaluation criteria, so I won't uh, go over it again. You can see it uh, all there and, and uh, noted. As, um, we will also have this webinar available on our website if you're um, wanting to watch it again or catch some of the, the pieces that we're saying or, or read some of the text in more detail. Um, in terms of how we will support the students, so we, are, we do have regularly scheduled professional development. As Philippe mentioned, we get together, we share. It is our hope that as a cohort, you share with each other and learn together. What we found and uh, last year is that many of the students were facing very similar challenges, challenges about data access, challenges about um, how to overcome some technical issues. And so even though you're working in completely different clinical areas, you might actually be uh, struggling with the same problem. So really using each other as a resource and we try and facilitate that through our professional development. We also try and give you uh, exposure to experts in the field, he hearing from their experiences, giving you advice on training as you're thinking about planning your career in this area. So those will be uh, provided and uh, an opportunity for you to present and share your findings um, a sort of research day at the end, which is a great opportunity for you to get feedback in front of a panel of experts. Um, and, and so those are the types of opportunities. In terms of specific training, it's, it's a, uh, we don't, we tend not to go into specific areas unless again, we think it's something that's very common to all because everyone's working in 
quite different areas. So some are doing NLP, some are doing qualitative work, some are doing, um, you know, work on imaging studies. So the specific niche areas can be all over the place, but there are some common threads across all, pro all projects and some common professional development opportunities that we like to foster. So that's where we like to focus. Okay, next slide. And then we will, we will uh, turn over to uh, some of the other Q&A that's um, come up in the chat. So do you have to have worked previously or have previous AI research to apply? So this is a great question. So not necessarily, or I should say not at all. Uh, in fact, this is an undergraduate research program. The, the goal of this really, for many of you, will be to give you that first experience in AI medicine. So maybe this is your first uh, exposure to it, and that's absolutely fine. And we're very happy to support those applications. So it's not that we're just looking for people that already know exactly what they're doing and they, this is their fourth project like this and funding them. I mean, certainly if you're building on momentum, that, that's useful. But if this is your first experience, it's absolutely fine. Um, the key thing is that the expertise that you're bringing to the project um, will vary depending on what the project is. So that it's really key that it's a good fit and it's clearly articulated what you're going to learn and how you, how you will be well supported in that lab or that environment to learn that. Um, if you do have AI experience, so some people that have, are part of our program have worked in AI before and maybe AI development, and that's great as well. Uh, you're working in a new context, you're deepening your skills in a particular area, that's fine as well. So our program really is open to individuals that might be new to the field, but also those that are in the field. I don't want anyone to think that you have to have experience to apply to this program. That's not the intent. The intent is really to foster that experience. And for those that do have experience, this also may, may be a great opportunity for you to continue that work. And we would encourage both of those types of applications. Uh, next question here, what would be the specific responsibilities of an accepted student? So we've covered this a bit, but just to be specific about it. So the first, uh, your specific day-to-day -day work depends on the chosen project and your supervisor. So the, your day -to -day, what your day-to-day -day looks like, you know, that will be a discussion for you to have with your supervisor. Um, and I would ask also, uh, when you have that discussion with your supervisor, what they expect of you uh, and, you know, frequency of meeting and, and things like that. From the TCARE perspective, we are requiring you to attend the professional development sessions. And we have here approximately one and a half hours every two weeks. That can vary from week to week. And sometimes um, we they're shorter or longer, depending uh, on what we're doing that particular week. Um, so that's our uh, requirement. We also require that you present your work at the end of the session and uh, that we can hear about your project and get a summary of your project at the end. So that's where our requirements are. And of course, participating in other TCARM activities as you're able. Uh, we also facil will facilitate your interactions with each other um, for networking possibilities. Um, AI and medicine, uh, you know, seems like a big field, but there's probably a small number of people right now that are really engaged with it. So making those connections in the context of a program like this can actually serve you very well for lifelong collaboration. So we'll try and make sure that you're connected and building these collaborations. Really valuable to have the opportunity to collaborate, make new uh, connections, learn from all the other projects that are happening. You know, hearing about all the other projects will be your way to be a fly on the wall about another lab. Uh, or another experience that you're very interested in, but you haven't had the opportunity to do that research yourself. So those are the types of connections we will try and foster in our program. Uh, I want to know the requirements and more information about this research. And uh, this is a good time to emphasize the uh, website where you have all of the information about the program. You have details about the program from last year and this year, and you, you also have the detailed forms that are needed to fill out this program. Okay, next slide. And I think this is our last uh, of the questions that we received and then we can open it up and go to some other questions. Um, curious about what to include in your resume or CV. Uh, how do you stand out if you don't have other past experiences? Great, um, great question. So again, we aren't just looking for people that have specific expertise in AI and medicine. We're looking for students that have a strong track record and potential for success. So we might be looking at any accomplishments, projects, awards, leadership positions, volunteer positions, projects you've worked on. 
anything. It doesn't have to be specifically related to AI. It shows us that you're a determined student, uh, you're, you have a high likelihood of success because you've been able to succeed in other areas. Um, and in the project itself, you can articulate that you're, uh, you know, why you're interested and in the project form itself and how this is a growth opportunity for you. What specific technologies can students expect to be working with during the internship? And again, this varies quite a bit. That list in the beginning hopefully gives you a flavor of the types of, uh, I would say, technologies and data that you'll be working with. So again, it ranged from uh, imaging data, uh, free text data where uh, people were working with NLP. There were a lot of projects related to machine learning models that were already developed. Uh, and maybe it was a refining of that model or an implementation evaluation of that model. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there were a couple of projects doing qualitative work to understand implementation, design considerations, ethical implications. Uh, there were some projects that involved doing reviews and uh, synthesizing evidence and evaluations of AI technologies in particular contexts. So uh, it's a very wide range. Um, I will say also that you know, this is a good question for your supervisor of whether actually you're working with data yourself or are you working with a team? So um, it's not unusual, actually it's typical and preferable that you have a team around these types of projects. So you might have a data engineer, uh, you might have uh, someone with content expertise in a particular machine learning methodology, you have a clinician, you might have also a statistician. So you know, typically you may not be doing all aspects of the project, right? You might be working with a team and have a specific role in that team. So, um, you know, it, it's, it is a wide range. Um, I would say that uh, almost all the projects had a direct clinical impact need. These are actually um, areas of AI medicine or specific technologies that are, are, are being advanced and uh, considered for implementation. A few of them were just developing uh, to begin with. Uh, next question, would you say that having knowledge of coding language would be helpful? So the answer to this is depends if you're expected to actually be doing coding yourself. So I would say it is probably helpful, um, but it you know, you, as I just mentioned in the previous one, you may not be doing all the coding yourself. You might be, uh, be doing a big part of it, but you might actually not be, you might be working with a team who's doing that coding. Um, and depending on the needs of the project, you may not be uh, required to actually have uh, coding knowledge to begin. So it really depends on the nature of the project that you've picked to put forward. What are some of the learning opportunities from this? So I think first and foremost, uh, this is an opportunity to really be embedded and get that practical experience. And that's the most valuable part. You know, whether you do work on the beginning part or an end part, or you understand the complexity of trying to unpack very complicated data, that's going to give you very valuable, uh, you know, hands-on experience of what this field is actually about, what it takes to uh, make advances in this field, and what it takes to have impact. Um, but in addition, uh, there's probably specific learning opportunities uh, in the lab. So there might be an opportunity to do presentations or contribute to peer reviewed publications or abstracts. And so I, I, would I would encourage you to have that discussion with your supervisor. We give you an opportunity to present to the TCARM community, which is very valuable. We um, invite some of our top uh, members and executive to, to hear those presentations. So you'll get quite a bit of exposure. And the other uh, point on exposure is we will announce all the winners on our website. We will profile their work as long as we know about it. So we ask you to keep us updated. And so you will um, have this valuable experience on uh, your CV. You'll have the hands-on connections. You'll make all of these collaborations from people doing AI and medicine projects across the university and the hospitals. And you also sort of get some profile from the work you're doing. We'd love to profile uh, your work and any interesting aspects that come up. Um, I've already mentioned the really opportunity to learn from each other and also participate in uh, professional developments, uh, workshops and other initiatives. And Philippe, I, I wondered if you'd want to add anything else uh, on that part. Um, about initiatives? Yeah, about some of the um, initiatives that the uh, participating students can get involved with, aside from their project uh, through the summer program. 
Yeah, I mean, we really encourage um, thinking broadly about how you'd like to get involved, uh, not just in terms of your own research and still development, but in terms of uh, outreach as well. One thing we did last year that um, a lot of the summer students took part in and found to be really rewarding was uh, an Ask a Scientist session. So we were paired with a summer class from the Toronto District School Board um, studying information technology. And basically um, each student presented a little blurb about their summer research as well as their educational background. Try to give um, kids in high school a bit of a sense of how do you even get to the point of knowing you want to study AI and medicine and what could that look like. Uh, students found it really rewarding, uh, both the secondary students as well as the summer program students, and it's something that we definitely intend on doing again this year. So things like that, outreach, and we're also open to suggestions as well from our trainees involved in the program. Great. Okay, I think that's it for the questions we have prepared. I guess I will go to um, the chat and try and tackle some of the questions that have been unanswered. So are students who are gonna graduate this summer eligible for the program? So um, for this particular one, um, I'm just gonna say that uh, roll back up to the am I, can you go back to the am I eligible slide? Cause there's a few questions about this uh, Zoriana. So I just wanna go back to this slide. Okay, so students from any Canadian university who are enrolled uh, in an undergraduate or medical program who will complete an undergraduate or medical degree in May 2022. So if you're um, graduating by May 2022, then uh, you can uh, uh, you can certainly be part of the program. We will consider those. Essentially, the restriction is uh, we would not want to have students who are actively involved in school work during the summertime, uh, hence the language about not commencing graduate work in the summer. So yeah, essentially, it is a full time um, studentship. So you want to make sure that you're actually available full time if you're uh, chosen to take part in the program. Okay, so I'm just looking at the questions here. Can a supervisor apply or supervise more than one student's project of, in the program? The answer is yes, uh, you certainly can. So you can put in more than one application um, and we can't guarantee that all, all of the students will be uh, funded, of course, um, but certainly supervisors have put in, they might have a couple different projects for undergrads and that they are welcome to submit more than one. Are those taking continuing education, the entering graduate uh, September 2022 permitted to apply? So the answer is yes there. So if you're uh, finished your program requirements, and so you're done as of May 2022, and you may, might be starting graduate work in September, that's fine as well. Um, and it, um, But you're taking professional development, we don't consider professional development. It's really just about whether or not you're doing your uh, degree program requirements over the summer. Now, uh, you should, I will just caveat that with if your professional development uh, extra courses or, or whatever that you're doing on your own that you're taking, um, don't interfere with what's required from your supervisor in the, in the program. So if they're during the day or they're during a time when you're expected to be in the lab or working uh, with other lab mates, for example, that's just something you'll need to check with your individual supervisor. So I think we've answered that. Um, yeah, so there's a question about the period of time. Um, and we are expecting that this is a 10 week uh, program. And so even medical uh, uh, students, like th the requirement is that you are full time. So, I mean, Certainly there's probably workarounds on the number of hours and how that's made up. I would ask that you arrange that with your particular supervisor, if that's acceptable. The funding is for 10 weeks. Um, so if there's some arrangement made, then that's outside our purview. I will say that our programming is 10 weeks as well and you are expected to attend that. So if you're not able to attend the full 10 weeks of programming, it might be best to uh, apply on a time when it, that you are able to do that. 
Uh, for the application, what's the maximum length for CVs? Oriana, can I ask you to just chime in on that? She's typing the answer there. So you'll, you'll have the um, particulars about that. All the requirements for CV are clearly stated on the application link, but um, Zoriana will be able to put that in the chat. What would you say is the typical time period that a supervisor will respond to your email and have re expressed interest in your project? I wish I could say, uh, I know everybody's really, really busy right now and really struggling. Um, so I, I don't know, I can't give you a specific answer to that. And so there might be delays or you might have people that reach out to you and don't reach out back. I would just encourage you to follow up. Um, in the subject header, I would put the deadline for the application and say, you know, deadline approaching and something like, could you just let me know either way? Um, it's possible that the supervisor has found another student and they haven't let you know uh, yet, but um, we don't know specifically uh, on response time to individual faculty, just that a lot of our faculty, especially our clinical factory faculty have been um, very busy with COVID the last month and the hospitals have been tremendously strained. So uh, it's just been a bit of context and, and many of them are, are having challenges keeping up with their research work in addition to the extra burden on the hospital. So that could be one of the explanations. Okay, so uh, is there a preference for medical students over undergraduate students or vice versa? Great question. No preference at all. So we had uh, undergraduate medical students as well as uh, undergraduate health science students as well. Um, uh, certainly we'll uh, really look for those that are best aligned with the objectives of the program. So um, do, certainly do not feel uh, that there's one preference or another. We just looked for ones where they had the best, you know, synergy and uh, fit with the program. So we had a mix of both last year. Um, to confirm, students will be collaborating with the supervisor to come up with their own research topic. Yes, that's exactly it. So ideally, uh, the supervisor has a range of work or a program or a grant already happening, and you're uh, engaging uh, with the supervisor on that. Sometimes uh, students come up with their brand new ideas themselves as well, and they ask the supervisor if they'd be willing to support it. The description of the project's really brief, so it's not... Um, you know, to keep in mind, it's only 10 weeks, uh, so we aren't expecting, you know, a full grant or, and we are understanding that uh, these are undergraduate students, this is some of their first experience, so it doesn't need to be, you know, a, a whole program of research, it just needs to be an element of a specific project, maybe one that's ongoing, or a new project that you'll be starting in collaboration with your supervisor. So I would share the application with your supervisor, and brainstorm some ideas on what would be feasible. We, we also look at feasibility. So, so it's better to be a more specific feasible program um, proposed than something that seems really out of scope for the, for the summertime. Are individuals in their final year, yes, uh, eligible to apply? Uh, yes, um, we've answered that a few times, as long as uh, they are gra graduating uh, May, 2022. Um, do we need to satisfy all the supervisor requirements to apply? Uh, yes, there are requirements uh, as listed on the application form about who can be a faculty supervisor. So just have to make sure that that faculty member does meet that require those requirements. If you have any questions, you can send an email. There's an email address. You're wondering about your eligibility and you want to check before you put your application in, please do so in advance and we will check that for you. And we answered this. Uh, last question live. Um, I'm just going to quickly go to the chat. Um, nothing in specific there. And then uh, I will go to the questions that have been answered. I think we have covered pretty much everything. Uh, it's been fantastic questions. So thank you all so much for, for bringing those questions forward. I think we covered a lot today. Um, any Final questions anyone wants to ask? Philippe, anything you want to add from your end? Or Zoriana, anything you want me to uh, cover? We'll just hang on a couple more minutes to see if there's any additional questions. I think if I were to just leave any like last words here, um, we're not um, prioritizing any particular educational background over another. 
or any institution over another. Uh, it, in fact, we're, we would love to have like a wide diversity of students from across Canada and across backgrounds. Of course, like Laura said, uh, having um, the ability to meet the objectives um, that are laid out for a research project is a necessary requirement to have a supervisor decide to take you on. But outside of that, you could be studying anthropology and have a great experience in a summer research project um, in our program here. So um, we are very uh, much thinking broadly here and we want to invite any interested applicants who feel like this would be a great experience for them and aligns with their career and educational goals. Okay, great. Thank you, Philippe. A couple more questions trickled in. So one uh, important question came up, Zoriana answered it in the chat, but I'll just reiterate. You can't hold multiple studentships. So it is the expectation that if you're holding, you know, an undergraduate answer reward or TKM and it's Karen, you wouldn't be eligible. We really are uh, reserving these funds for uh, students that don't have any awards and this would be the reward, or you might choose to keep this award and turn down another award if this is more appropriate for your educational needs. Um, we were asked if we could repeat whether students can submit multiple applications with multiple supervisors. Um, you certainly can. We don't have a rule that says you can't, but uh, you just want to think about how that looks with the um, admissions committee. So we really want to pick where there's a lot of good synergy and a lot of good opportunities. So if you're applying for multiple positions in, in multiple, it doesn't necessarily increase your chances is what I'm trying to say. I would encourage you to you know, try and maximize the one you really want to do. Um, there's no rule though. If you feel that there's two different projects, you love them both and they're equally important to you, you can definitely put uh, you know, more than one in, but it's not, it's not a guarantee it increases your chances. And it, you know, it kind of sometimes makes it difficult for us to understand uh, which one's most important to you. What does T program, uh, uh, programming cover? Uh, so I'll just answer that again. Uh, we did, we did cover that in quite a bit of detail, but I'll just, um, mention again quickly, our, our programming really is about making sure that you are connected with each other and researchers and expert researchers in the field. So you'll meet a lot of AI and medicine um, leaders and making sure that you're interacting with them. We cover some professional development skills that we feel cut across all the projects. So we don't go into detailed programming or technical skills of AI because not all projects require that, but we might talk about ethics and implementation, for example. We might talk about design considerations and clinical environments. We might talk about uh, workflows or data structures or things that we think cut across um, all types of projects. Um, and we do, lastly, uh, our programming uh, ensures that you become comfortable talking about and presenting your work and your contributions to AI and medicine. So there is a research presentation at the end, an opportunity to present your work in front of experts uh, who will give you feedback um, so that you can sort of start building up your own uh, research voice in this particular area. Okay, so there's another question uh, about making the application uh, competitive. Um, can you just go to the next slide, uh, Zoriana? So we, we covered this um, a bit, but I'll just reiterate uh, the things that we're really looking for is that the project itself has strong relevance to AI and health. So, um, you know, if it's just a technical piece that, you know, could be about health, but could be about something else that's, you know, that would get lower priority than something that's really relevant for AI in, in the health context. And we also really look at the training environment. So you want a good description of the environment that the project's going into. And so we prioritize the applications where we feel that there's a strong uh, training environment and we know that the students will be well supported and get a lot of really great research experience out of it. We also look at the candidate in terms of academic record, leadership, award, those do not have to be specific to AI in any way, but we look for just um, a strong indication of success from the student uh, point of view. Okay. I think we have covered a lot. Um, 
Great. And I just want to emphasize um, that the this recording of this webinar will be posted on the TKRM website and uh, you, all the information that was included in this webinar will be available. So if there's something you want to come back to or you missed or you want to hear again, you are welcome to watch again. Uh, also, there's a lot of detail on the application itself. And lastly, there is an email address um, that's it, at the bottom of the application that you'll see. So if there's additional questions that you have uh, before the application about eligibility or anything else, please send those questions in advance and we will do our best to uh, respond and make sure that you have the answers you need before you apply. Okay, I think we are, oh, another question. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you also for attending. Uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing these questions in advance. It really helped and you helped uh, each other as well because these are common questions that everybody has. So uh, thank you all for your great interest and your participation in today. Really look forward to seeing your applications and having another great year of the program. Uh, okay, we got one more question. I'm going to squeeze it in. <laughs> does the current does the PI's current grant from TCARM affect the decision? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I, I mean, in a good way, and, and in a good way, I mean, um, if you have a happen to have a grant from TCARM, that's great. Uh, if you don't happen to have a grant from TCARM, that's great as well. Uh, what you want to mention is that uh, in the environment section, I would mention that there's funding for this work. And it's already been recognized in this way and that will add to the environment section to know that the students coming into a resource project that um, that already is sort of on its way and has some funding behind it that that's where it helps but whether or not they have a specific TKRM grant or not we don't consider that in our evaluation criteria in terms of uh, decisions um, after the applications are due which are mid-february we try and just uh, turn those decisions around by march so candidates should hear by March uh, whether or not they were successful for the programs to facilitate their planning. All right. Okay. I think we we've exhausted our all our questions. Again, please email if there's anything else. Thank you all for your interest, and we really look forward to seeing these uh, great projects this year. Bye, everybody. Take care, everyone.